June the 29th and you're watching, you're listening to Curiously Polar. See, I noticed you're listening to, because this is an audio podcast, not just a video show. Hello, everyone. We are back with another episode of Curiously Polar. With me are Henry and Mario. Buenas, buenasera. No, buena. How do you say this in... Buongiorno. Buongiorno. That, that was the other one was Spanish, wasn't it? No, it was good evening in mixing, Italian. That was very good. Yeah. Mixing, yeah, mixing up times. My, mixing up my languages. Um good day, gentlemen. How are things in how Romania? Are uh, awesome. Great. A little bit too hot uh, for my personal feeling, but um that's things you can't really change at the moment. And how are things in Tromsø? In Tromsø it's uh, drizzly, uh, 10 degrees. Nice. I mean, this must Sounds this must awesome. be one of the weirdest setups. Okay, two Germans, one Italian, <laughs> one living in Germany, one living in Romania, and one living in Tromsø of all places. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we are in a, a transect across Europe. It is it is wild, and uh, we also what a what a segue. We also have a wild set of topics for you today. Um, <laughs> uh, we've been doing what we do. We have taken time to collect things throughout the week and uh I, I, I guess probably this is gonna be mainly a polar newsreel show today because we have so many things uh and so many interesting things on that so i think we can just kick it off with a new ocean we have yes. a new ocean how did how awesome, does that isn't it? happen like poof here it is how <laughs> how does a new, new ocean, ocean there. come into existence <laughs> let, let me open the web page from life science um what does that entail? What does that mean? Well, I think the the big news uh, have been or has been that um, National Geographic um, finally recognized the Southern Ocean around uh, Antarctica as a separate ocean, mm. and um, there has been a debate in scientific community if the features of the Southern Ocean are enough to classify it as a separate ocean, or if it's just a prolongation of the three major oceans, uh, Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Ocean, or um, if it indeed is an own uh, ocean. And uh, National Geographic now um, yeah, confirms or recognizes the um, scientific proof of that it has enough features to uh, be defined as an own ocean. When you say National Geographic, are you talking about the publication National Geographic? Yeah. Yes, the are National they, Geographic Society. Are they society. the ones who, who can say this is an ocean and <laughs> this is not an ocean? No, that's that's what the article is about. It's not about a scientific um, approval or um, how, how to say it, contents uh, in there. National Geographic has evaluated the, the data over the years and has now come to the conclusion that there is a majority of scientists um, or a majority of studies proving that the Southern Ocean has the features of an own ocean and by that recognizes that. So in their in their maps, and that's kind of in popular um, literature or popular media, um, the National Geographic maps are like the, the benchmark for others and uh, by ah. that... Having so, that so in their it's, National it's, Geographic it's the maps. mapping entity of National Geographic, pretty much, because I, I, I yeah. don't know the exact setup, but I think th those are kind of separate entities anyway. There's National Geographic <laughs> Travel, and there's maps, and there's uh, the magazine, and so on. Yeah, but there is true. also, isn't there also a commission on uh, geographic names uh, that has to be uh, approving these names? That is true, but I think the Southern Ocean has been approved a long time ago. Even though it wasn't really um, defined as an own ocean, yeah. But in any case, with the circumpolar current practically uh, blocking the uh, exchange between the uh, all the other oceans that that are north of uh, the uh, of the of the uh, Antarctic Ocean, that's uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's actually it's actually a, it's actually a barrier, a physical barrier for uh, exactly for most marine life. And that's exactly the the reason why now it has come to the conclusion that this barrier, the polar front, um, really uh, defines a new ocean or mm. a separate ocean. But uh, the polar front also varies throughout the year and also yeah. throughout the different years between one year and the other. So there must be quite... Uh, you, you cannot really say this is where the Atlantic Ocean stops. 
It's much more difficult than the other oceans, certainly. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Anyway, so so who good. who defines these boundaries now? I mean, uh, is it, there must be on a map there must be like a line uh, that uh, delineates <laughs> these line. oceans, isn't that the case? Or how can you oh, say? The, the I, IMO, I don't know. I'm not Let, sure. Let's say you have a you have a ship's accident. You have to say where it happened, right? Or what? Do yeah, you, that's what yeah. when you have GPS coordinates for. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I I think yeah. Uh, I think you do like, for example, for the north, like the, you take the, an, a mean, an average of all the positions throughout the years or the past 20 years or 50 years of the position of the second quarter current. So you know where it is. Like in this map that you have on the screen now, there is a, oh. an Antarctic second polar current. And that's, uh, that's pretty much a line that is an average over or an approximate position. Plus the deadline on the screen is actually several tens of miles wide on real life. Right and and over the year this would this is a kind of a wobbly line anyway mm. it's not static okay mm. i get it ha ah. all right mm -hmm. um speaking of waters and bodies of water there is a new lake well, there that was. has that, that there has was disappeared lake. right yes what what's that about there has been a, a, a meltwater lake discovered um, or observed in, on, on Amory Ice Shelf in Antarctica, one of the largest ones. And um, the Australian researchers have observed it and have researched it, and the the, the surface of the Meltwater Lake uh, has frozen over, so it was um, a subsurface lake, but in the ice mm. shelf itself. And then suddenly that water drained, and by that the frozen surface just collapsed, and for some reason it then just got blown up so now we have kind of a um yeah like a little dome on that ice shelf and uh, that's the interesting thing uh, so that's quite interesting we, all this water is then gone through cracks in the bottom of the glacier and uh, maybe lubricated the uh, surface between the uh, glacier and the bedrock so it's it might be moving faster now this is an interesting article that you've brought up here um at kpbs with um well you cannot just listen to it here which uh, kpbs i guess is a is a radio station but um they also have like uh the the amount of water that escaped the lake is, is superimposed <laughs> on the skyline of new york so you see this huge cube of water which gives you on top of Manhattan. <laughs> On top of Manhattan. You get, kind of get an idea that that's not a tiny little lake. It's mm. quite significant. Um, yeah. And then they also have like a, a video about this on the, on the webpage. So interesting thing to look at for sure. Hmm. Very, very interesting. A lake collapse. You don't see this very often. No particularly. I mean, that's something that the um, research or the, the the study so far doesn't really answer is why did it get elevated after it collapsed so the, the frozen surface on the lake just collapsed when the, when the water just drained out and then it got elevated again so why did it get elevated so what's what's in there and that's going to be interesting and that's a further research right now from the antarctic um uh, the australian antarctic division because they are the closest uh, on the amory ice shelf and um yeah that's going to be very interesting to to just follow up Hmm. Could be the water went into uh, like the liquid water went down and then froze and then expanded, or yeah. is the elevation too too high? I'm not sure about that. Hmm. Uh, there was no further information in there on that. Yeah, quite okay. interesting. Let's see if we can find more information about this. Yes. So uh, next topic in the let's say in the general area of. Um, of things that the years are throwing at us. We are uh, in 2021, and the, this year and the last year were quite interesting in terms of things that happened that nature threw at us. Um, here's another one that, I don't know, should I be concerned? There is an organism <laughs> that's been living, well, that, that's been frozen in Siberia in the permafrost for 24,000 years, and they have just like thawed it up and it just came back to life what does that mean is this dangerous are we are we all gonna die well, well no. yes we are but, well, uh, well how, we are, are all we, going to die, gonna, gonna die maybe quicker? maybe not because of this one here <laughs> i mean uh, this organism is a multicellular organism so it's mm. uh, they're called the rotifer and they are actually in 
practically all bodies of water uh, all over the all over the globe. So it's not uh, it's not particularly dangerous in in this case. And uh, the interesting part is when you uh, the interesting thing here is when you can find an organism that has been frozen for such a long time and there is no decay of the DNA or nothing that actually impairs its function when it's thawed up again. And uh, I mean, we can talk about cryopreservation of, uh, of people and, uh, and it's, it was science fiction, but we are getting closer to uh, being able to freeze uh, multicellular organisms and thawing them and finding out why and how it can do this it's it's amazing there was uh, some time ago something about uh, a tardigrade these uh, small tiny little teddy bears that can be uh, can survive all sorts of uh, situations and uh, like being shot at a uh, shot uh, at a surface with high speed wasn't and there were there yeah. some out in out in outer space and came back and were still yeah, alive Exactly. So it's uh, it's actually new things that we discover about life, and and as many as most animals, this uh, organism is made of cells. This rotifer is made of cells, and these cells contain a, a watery saline solution, and this also expands when it's frozen. And in this case, of course, the animal was definitely frozen, and it uh, in normally it would break out the cell walls and in this case it didn't so its cell walls are also special and studying maybe something that would look insignificant and very small it's uh, still uh, it can it can surprise us and it can give us uh, indications how to survive a frostbite for example or maybe freeze ourselves and hope that yeah. <laughs> hope that whatever <laughs> we're we're uh, de whatever disease we have might be curable in yeah. A few thousand years. Exactly. Hmm. Well, life, life yeah, finds either. a way. As they say, life finds a way. Unless it doesn't, which is the next <laughs> article that, uh, that we have here in the newsreel. This is in National I Geographic love your Magazine. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I'm really on, to on top of my game today. Um, this is from National Geographic Magazine, and it is an article about soils from Antarctica that seem to contain no life, which... Which, which blows yeah. my mind because I was under the impression and from all I've learned in the past is that uh, that you could pick up a handful of soil from anywhere in the world and it would have bacteria in it and some life forms. But yes, this is exactly. apparently not the case everywhere. Exactly. And this is, uh, we're talking about soil. We're not talking about uh, like sand or like we're talking about something that should be fertile and should be, uh, should be, containing bacteria and there are no places before this study there were no places on earth where the soil didn't contain bacteria so some form of life and in this case uh, and they of course put a caveat that they might not have seen everything but in this case they have researched with the PCR so with the same system that you have with the with um, in order to find uh, if you have had uh, COVID uh, in your in your samples, so amplifying the DNA, like trying to figure out if there is any trace of life in if you can find DNA in this soil, and it's not possible to find DNA, and uh, and this is really interesting. If you're talking about something that is totally sterile, well, that soil is probably <laughs> just as sterile as an operation chamber, or maybe even more. Hmm. Yeah, and where Do was they... it found? Sorry. That's uh, that's in Antarctica, and uh, in uh, like uh, now there are uh, several places that are visited by animals, and of course these, if you're talking about uh, in the Antarctic Peninsula, where there are colonies of penguins or birds, but if we're going further in in the dry valleys, then uh, you have places where there are no vertebrate life apart from a few researchers and and this actually brings to us the uh, the importance of being careful when exploring things exploring places because when we move we bring with us all of my our microbiome and uh, and it's very difficult to uh, to not to leave a trace like uh, the debates so that were with the uh, perforations that the russians did in antarctica to the lake vostok and uh, so you have a lake that is uh, 
that has been isolated for for let's say several thousands of years, not millions of years, and and then you just break through the surface to find out what there is in there, but then you also may bring something. There was so, a big debate about that, actually, uh, when yes. they drilled down. Yeah. So, yeah, br bringing things, leave no trace and so on. Um, yes. but, but, that, but not having found any DNA in there means there also haven't been any animals leaving behind poop and other things. For quite some time, at least. Yeah. For quite some time, because DNA, of course, degrades with time. So, but it's uh, very, very you... durable, isn't it? I mean, there is, from from um, from a completely different field, from computer technology, there are now DNA-based uh, methods to save data that you can read back thousands sure. of years later. So, must have uh, must mean that there haven't been animals in a very long time. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's quite interesting. And linking back to the episode last week when we uh, were looking uh, at uh, dinosaurs in Antarctica, <laughs> well, well, they didn't leave a trace in this place, anyways. Or that we cannot find a trace in this place. Is pretty crazy. So um, next up, and that's a bit. That's a bit of a. We, we kind of smuggled this into the newsreel, um, and we start this off with uh, an Arctic circumnavigation by. Best Explorer. What's that about, Mario? You brought this one. Yeah, I brought this one here because, uh, well, first of all, because uh, Best Explorer is a uh, is very close to me and my family because it's actually uh, my father's uh, boat and not just my father's, but it's uh, the property of an uh, an association founded by my father, and uh, um, my father just uh, is one of the few people that has uh, done a circumnavigation of the Arctic. Uh, north of the continents. Now, now you see there is a l very long uh, tour down in the Pacific because these are uh, all all after, individual yeah. Uh, yeah. mark marker point geomarkers uh, on this map yeah. that you seeing if you're watching the video, and it's yes. it's a pretty extensive uh, route he's taken. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, the the points market. are each each uh, of uh, the position of these uh, emergency trackers that you have, and ah, he had okay. a, an emergency tracker on board. And he was not alone, but he's the one person that has done on board that has done all of the all of the uh, uh, legs in in this uh, passage here. And uh, this uh, started in uh, 2012 in Tromsø in northern Norway and um, went first through the Northwest Passage, then down the uh, west coast of the North America, and then across the Pacific, and then up uh, in Indonesia to Japan. And then uh, two years ago, just before COVID uh, struck us, uh, he arrived back in Tromsø, taking the Northeast Passage again. <laughs> and uh, that, as, is, as uh, that do, is quite right? impressive for a small <laughs> sailboat, because... Best Explorer is a small sailboat. It's how, only how big is 51 it? feet. Yeah, about okay. 15 and something meters. So it's not a, it's not a big vessel. And uh, it's a steel-built vessel, built in Italy and designed in Italy. And, uh, and that's actually the vessel I started working on in 92 when I started with my research on marine mammals. And, that's uh, awesome. And after, uh, and in 2006, he be went for sale and... Uh, yeah, that's where it became, when he started a new life, a new lease of life, and uh, is now here in Tromsø. There's also hmm. a blog in Italian, so you'd yes. have to run it through Google Translate or something, um, which tells you a bit more about the boat and its adventures. Here's another um, route. Yeah, that was the last leg, yes. That's the uh, Northeast Passage from Japan over to Tromsø. Oh, oh here's a, here's in, a photo of the, yeah. of the ship. Yeah. Uh, and you can go in and, uh, and, uh, and get a little more details of this. But, uh, oh, yeah. There we go. So, so it's slightly larger than a standard con uh, shipping container. Yes. Slightly <laughs> larger, yes. Yeah. Slightly larger, but not... Uh, not, no, not <laughs> at least longer, at least longer. Yeah, <laughs> yes, not so sure exactly. about the volume, though. <laughs> oh, with <laughs> no, text the specs and everything. Not. So one of the reasons, one of the reasons why we're talking about the... Uh, yeah, your, your dad and his uh, ship is that um, he's almost ready to go on a next quest and we might be able to get some more uh, in-depth information about that. What's that about? Yeah, the um, the next expedition, which is uh, starting in a, in a few weeks, is uh, it's an expedition to Svalbard 
and uh, it's uh, in a system of expedition, a series of expeditions uh, called the Polar Quest. And uh, these are organized uh, to group uh, several European researchers and uh, they are uh, uh, taking advantage of uh, Best Explorer as a smaller vessel and flexible and uh, with the flexibility of moving up to uh, to, uh, to very close to the shore, for example, and um, not having too many projects running at the same time. And uh, the, here you see the uh, the different members of the expedition this summer. Uh, mainly the main organizer is Paola Catapano here, who works at uh, CERN in uh, Geneva. And, uh, and on the top right you see my father. And, uh, and they are going to uh, sail from Tromsø over to Svalbard and then take several stops in Svalbard for mainly four uh, projects that you can see uh, a little further down. So they are going to be uh, looking uh, for non-invasive and uh, practical uh, solutions for small vessels to investigate the environment. One thing is they're going to be looking, they're taking samples from the fjord and taking eDNA samples. So samples for looking for eDNA. What is eDNA? And, uh, yeah, environmental DNA oh. stands for, and uh, it means that... Uh, if you consider that any organism leaves some DNA behind when they are moving through their environment, and this DNA has some sort of permanence, like we were saying before, well, if you take a sample, for example, on of the water, you will be able to check which organisms, which species have been in the environment that you sampled from. So you take a sample of the water in a fjord where there are blue whales and you should find DNA from blue whales. So by taking a sample, analyzing it for DNA and checking which animal this DNA is coming from, then you can have either a category of animals like vertebrates or fish or, or whales and, and then come down in many cases to the species level. So this is not just an explorer, an explorative um, mission. That's also a very scientific mission. I like this. It's very scientific, and this is just one of the projects. They are then investigating using drones the uh, uh, location and the, the the dynamics and the uh, and the shape of the several glaciers. So they are mapping uh, mm -hmm. some glaciers uh, with uh, with the um, with the drones and they're going to be taking samples of the uh, water as close as possible as pro as close as uh, defendable <laughs> for safety to the front of the glacier for microplastics and this is uh, also a uh, a very uh, a very actual uh, how do you call it it's also very much in the news of uh, this with the microplastics it's not just uh, the uh, bigger piece of plastic that we see on the beaches that are a problem but the small fragments that are left behind when these bigger large large bodies of plastic they uh, they decompose or they disintegrate do we speak about uavs or submersible drones we are talking about uh, both uh, uh, both kinds. I mean, for the mapping of the size of glacier, Fly, yes, flying and diving about fly, drones, flying drones, yes. but also yeah, sorry. also underwater drones. <laughs> Just if keeping they the all, language straight. If they all work, of course, yes. <laughs> yeah, because I was yeah. I was I was uh, wondering about the microplastic or microplastic um, pollution. How you want to um, map that? Well, microplastic, yes, microplastic is going to be more difficult to to map from from air and. But with um, no, with uh, with the sampling of the water, this yeah. is uh, what they want to get to, and and also checking how close to the glacier. I mean, ideally, we'd get the water, the melt water from the glaciers, and see if there is anything that they can get from there. But uh, I think that that is. Uh, I mean, I'm not into the actual details of the different projects here, but uh, this is uh, quite an interesting, quite an interesting uh, and very very actual thing to look at but just thinking yeah. that ahead if they find microplastic in the melt water of a glacier in, in Svalbard what would the implications be from that well there are there are two things because the 
the one way the microplastics can originate from one place the microplastic can originate from is the melt water from the surface of the glacier. So the snow accumulating on the top of the glacier then melting seasonally can transport some microplastics. And, and this is trying to figure out if there is some air transport of microplastics. I mean, there are small particles and where are they coming from and how do they get there? Like we were talking about pollution, like molecules are of course transported by the air and then can precipitate on the top of the glacier. But can microplastic also have this global spreading and, and not uh, just by And the question is also of the, the transport in the glacier. I mean, can, can some of that stuff yes. melt on the top and come out at the bottom? I guess that's probably, yes. that's probably the case. That's probably the case. And uh, there are, like it's a totally new uh, place to look for microplastics. And and then, of course, there is also like how far back did the glacier contain microplastics? Mm -hmm. So if the microplastics has come into the glacier and possibly by air transport, like how far back do we see the microplastics Plastic. problem? Plastic dating is probably quite difficult unless you have certain plastics that are only that have only been used in the, I don't know, 1950s or something that um, that are yeah, no exactly. longer used. Anyway, or additives to the plastic, so you can yeah. by analyzing what kind of plastic, what kind of chemicals you have in them, you can see what is the at least a, what age they should be have at the most. <laughs> like how old can they can they get? Interesting. So yeah, but that's then the, the 2021 expedition, if I understood that correctly, has yeah. also another goal, doesn't it? Yeah, well, they uh, they were looking, and actually, are two more goals. So before we go to the one that you're probably hinting at, uh, we uh, they are also looking at uh, driftwood. Now, mm -hmm. Svalbard, I mean, you both have been to Svalbard and uh, traveled extensively. And one of the characteristics of Svalbard, you find a lot of wreckage on the beaches. And you find a lot of wood. And uh, one interesting thing to look at when you look at driftwood is where, where does it come from? And, uh, and then the other is why are there some beaches, like, for example, in Woodfjord, strangely named, but uh, actually because there are no trees, but, <laughs> but it's full of wood. <laughs> why do they end up in Woodfjord rather than another fjord? And, uh, and uh, where do they come from? A little Pro bit probably like, going uh, to discover something like wood magnetism. How about that? <laughs> yeah, they could be, but uh, <laughs> but the important part, and and we have had a, a very excellent example of uh, like inspiration coming from driftwood is from Nansen, that yes, got the inspiration of his polar drift with the Fram by uh, finding driftwood of a wreck from northeast Siberia that came all the way down to Greenland. So, Which we had an episode about, actually. Exactly. Uh, do you remember the number of the episode? <laughs> um, not out of my pocket. It must we'll, be 20, 127 or something like that. Yeah, we'll yeah. figure it so, out and put it in the show notes. Exactly. And uh, and that's, that's very important. I mean, knowing where is driftwood coming, because also with global change, we have changes in uh, uh, ice cover, but also in ocean circulation. Is there something that we can... Get episode from 129 this. Ah. 129 for the nansen and uh like if we if we can uh, uh, time and observe what are the patterns of driftwood that we find now and uh, maybe relate to patterns of driftwood uh, circulation and deposition previously then we can maybe also predict where the um where the future pollution is drifting to yeah, that will help a lot to answer the question why an archipelago up in the north, in, in the Arctic Ocean, which has only two and a half thousand inhabitants, is so much affected by uh, plastic pollution. Like when you go to the beach, I mean, the the beach cleanup uh, in Svalbard has become a thing on pretty much every expedition cruise, and um, the kind of disappointing 
effect is you clean up one day, you come back the next day, and it looks pretty much the same when you start from scratch. Uh, and exactly. uh, answering that question um, helps a lot to figure out where does it come from, um, which is now kind of analyzed by checking the, um, the remnants of, their, of, of what's found on the beaches and trying to um, identify where it comes from. But um, yeah, getting a better picture of the ocean currents here and um, the entire very complex system on, on, on the currents, that's going to be very interesting. Yes, precisely. And then the last but not least uh, goal of the expedition is uh, that you were hinting at, probably, I yes. read your mind, <laughs> There is that they are going to be uh, doing uh, some mapping of the seafloor north of uh, Norauslandet. Uh, using a side scan sonar and uh, yes so the sonar project is an addition and uh, is uh, doing a cartographic uh, survey and it's an approved cartographic survey so it's uh, using a sonar it just doesn't only uh, give you the uh, depth of the bottom or like how long uh, what's the distance between the keel or the sensor and the bottom of the ocean but also by giving a picture like almost a three-dimensional picture of the bottom of the ocean and uh, and this is interesting not only for navigation for or geography for knowing how the bottom of the ocean looks like but also for finding things that are in the bottom of the ocean like in this case uh, an airplane be there yeah, they are going in this area because uh, it is an important uh, puzzle piece of the puzzle that they are looking for in the uh, polar exploration, and uh, that they are looking for the wreckage of the skeleton of the Italia airship. Ah, I remember uh -huh. we talked about this. And that rings rings a bell. Yeah, it rings a bell. It definitely does. Yeah. <laughs> So when uh, when Nobile uh, organized the uh, this uh, second expedition uh, to the to the Arctic region with the airships, I mean you remember that uh, the first expedition was with the airship called Norge, and uh, went over the North Pole and ended up in Teller in or close to Teller in Alaska. Well, a few years later, he uh, organized an expedition with a similar airship that uh, was called the Italia and uh, it was also it had the same uh, base of uh, origin in New Olesund and uh, flew several missions over several days over the uh, polar ice and uh, had as a last day mission the last planned expedition was up to the North Pole with the intention of uh, going uh, to land in, on the North Pole because the first expedition with the Norge had just uh, flown over the North Pole and thrown down a couple of messages and uh, and uh, mementos, a uh, message from the Pope or something. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, coming back from this expedition, the Italia experienced uh, technical problems and it crashed and it was on the ice and it uh, it has been uh, a the occasion of a, an enormous effort in search and rescue, probably the first multinational, uh, multi multi ship, multi airplane uh, effort made for a search and rescue in the Arctic. And, and it involved uh, one of the main characters of the heroic age of uh, exploration, who disappeared while searching for Nobile. Yes, and you are hinting at Amundsen, yes. and Amundsen left, well, called uh, like uh, an expedition as well in going searching for Nobile. He left uh, from mainland Norway, uh, from Tromsø, and uh, it disappeared while flying over the Barents Sea, so on its way up to the search area, because uh, the uh, uh, position of the uh, the exact position of the uh, of the wreckage on the uh, or the uh, ice uh, uh, position where the uh, where the people or the crew of the Italia was uh, was that was more or less known but with a with a huge area of a search because they didn't have GPS coordinates and they had a, just a small wireless uh, set that was sending 
they were sending a message out uh, that they needed help and um and uh so there was a need for airplanes and it was actually an airplane that found the uh the party stranded on the ice and uh, it's a in, swedish airplane yeah. there's an, a nice um movie from the 60s uh, about the entire incident uh, the red tent um, named after the uh, tent that was I'm, i'm not sure if it was painted red or if, if the canvas was already red but um a very nice i, th I think it was a, a soviet co-production because obviously they got then rescued by a soviet icebreaker um so they had the a classic. exactly mm -hmm. a, um, an, an interest of uh, showcasing and highlighting that but it's actually a, a very nice um movie in the first place and it gives um a good background story around that and what's really interesting on that um oh, note is sean that connery sorry okay. yes <laughs> sean connery plays amundsen if i uh, remember correctly All right. and yeah. if um if i also remember correctly and that's the important note is that even though the airship crashed um almost all except for one could um could be rescued there was just one fatality if i remember correctly yeah there are the the um the airship uh, broke on the ice i mean it hit the ice because of uh losing um losing uh, altitude height altitude and uh, it crushed the ice the part of the gondola that was uh, the main part of the of the airship where the people were broke off and the rest of the wreckage tumbled away and uh, and it was visible from the red tent there where the gondola was it was visible and they saw more or less where it was so there is an indication of where the wreckage could have been but uh, then you know like uh, there was ice and uh, the people there they perished of course they were never found again and uh, the uh, and then the ice drifts away and uh who knows where the ice melted and released the wreckage it was a, a a structure a metal structure that is probably down somewhere in the bottom of the so, ocean so how <laughs> high are the chances of finding something there well it's uh, the the chances are are quite low but it's still possible oh, it would be uh, sensational if they would find something yes sure. it would be it would be quite sensational now if we think if we make a comparison the uh, Latam where uh, Amundsen uh, was flying when he appeared is in the in an area that has been searched extensively and is trawled by fishing boats and uh, it's been searched for with also with side scan sonar for oil and for explore mineral exploration in the Barents Sea and they haven't found the wreckage of this plane now it's a much smaller structure of course because the uh, Italia was about what is it 200 meter long or well, 100 meter long the good, the good thing long. is uh, Mara your father is involved in that whole thing because it's his <laughs> ship so um, what we're trying right now is to set something up where we might actually get him on the show as well so he can tell us mm. a bit more about this um, and I guess that kind of gets us to the end of the episode um, thanks everyone for watching one last little bit that I found uh, funny uh, you both have lived in Iceland so um, someone some an image went through uh, Twitter uh, over the last couple of days of a hotel phone that has a button that says Northern Lights wake up so the tourists who come to Iceland I just found this a uh, nice little Arctic almost Arctic um, thing Uh, so it's a very on. common service when you do a winter trip in Iceland. Isn't it? Yeah, I remember this yes. from, from various ships and so on. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, the show's over. <laughs> All right, everyone. Take care and bye-bye. <laughs>